Is that it? There. Yeah. Okay, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Nadif Sapira. I'm talking to you from my home in Wilmington, Delaware. Larry, do you have the full screen? Oh, no, it's better. Can you? Everything is good. We can see. We can see you, Dr. Shapira. We can see your screen. And uh, once again, all questions that came up for now will be answered at the end of that session. So, Dr. Shapira, please go ahead. Okay. So, good morning. Um, let me take it on from Stephanie Stott. At the beginning, I just want to give credit to for people. On the left, you see Laura Sunstein, who is a friend of mine, and she's one of the first, I think, first or second lipidema women in the US that went to be operated by Dr. Stutz that you see here uh, in Germany, and she came back and we spoke a lot about that lipidema, and she introduced me to uh, Karen Herbs that you see here, uh, Karen, uh, uh, Dr. Herbs really is a person who really brought lipidema to the American map uh, uh, after many, many years that people really did not know and just forgot about this disease. And here, of course, this is our beautiful Stephanie who was courageous enough to uh, work with me and move forward. Um, why it doesn't move, Lynn? Maybe I have to do it here. Okay. Well, lipidema was approved, uh, was the first described in 1940. Can't believe it, 80 years ago at the Mayo Clinic. And um, 10 years after that, the same authors described the characteristics of the disease. And I highlighted five of them because honestly, if you see the five of these, which was very simple actually observation, you really can make the diagnosis in vast majority of the patients. It appears only in, hum in women, very few men were described with lipidema. It's symmetrical like many other diseases. It's minimal involvement of the feet. Um, you don't have pitting edema like lymphedema. lymphedema. The pain and tenderness is a huge part of the diagnosis and the easy bruising. Uh, maybe I should add it here that it runs mostly in families, but if you one recognizes five items, it's lipidema. Very different. No other uh, entity uh, 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 characterized by all these five items. Um, the few stages of lipidema. Stage one is when the skin appears flat. You don't have any a, a large nodule underneath. Um, and you see, you can be in stage one and quite swollen legs, but that's primarily here, the skin is flat and the fat accumulates underneath the skin. Then comes stage two, that there's come some, start to have some indurations or the different sizes, and the skin appears much more deformed and irregular. And then comes stage three, where the indurations are, are larger, a, a lot of deformity of the skin, a, a, and it's clearly, you see the deposits of fat. Um, some people use not stages, but the types. I personally don't use it much because I get confused between which type is, which type is what. But please uh, recognize the fact that 80% uh, or more of the women, they can have lipidema in the arms, upper arms, sometimes in the forearms, and sometimes in the, uh, the uh, shoulder area. And another thing that's very characteristic is the ankle cuff that you can see here, uh, really separate between the area which is really has no lipidema and the area above that does have lipidema. Um, comorbidities or complications, very difficult to say which one is the results of the lipidema, which one comes with lipidema. So we'll put it together. So, one of the most important one is the one that affects uh, the skeleton, affects uh, the gait and mobility and the posture and arthritis. Another category is the soft tissue, which is obesity, which many, many times it's associated with lipidema. 
and definitely aggravated by the lipidema. And the other one is the lymphedema that associated or that uh, can complicate uh, when the uh, lipidema advances. And not less important is the pain and tenderness and the psychological, psychological uh, uh, impact is huge. Um, how to differentiate between lipidema and obesity? Well, just uh, quickly, I mean, lipidema usually starts at uh, puberty, obesity at any time. The pain, the, the fat in lipidema is painful, not in obesity. The easy bruising characteristic to lipidema um, you can lose weight, you can undergo bariatric surgery. The lipidema fat will not be affected by that. Um, and the disproportion between the lower body, which is large, and the upper body, which is smaller, uh, also characteristic. Here's the, uh, the first category of complication, the skeletal co a, 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 a complication of lipidema. Um, because of this big fat pockets at the inner thighs, in the knee, actually they're not so big here, but at times they're huge, you'll see some pictures soon. Um, the legs are, are separated because the person tried to avoid the chafing and the abrasion between the thighs. So they gradually uh, separate between the, the feet, which is called the valgus deformity, that start from the knee down. And as a result, the stress of the body weight distributed not through the knees, but between the knees. So, and that caused a lot of uh, stress, abnormal stress of the knee. Here's a patient that you see with the same problem. There's a problem with the knee problem here. Look at the, at the, at the ankle joint. And all that because of this huge fat pockets between the thighs. And this is Dr. Stutz, my mentor in Germany. He did a study and he showed where the point of pressure in these women, and he found it primarily at the inner metatarsal area. That's most of the pressure. Whereas in normal people, it's in three points, here, two, and three. This means it's primarily here. So uh, obesity, Many women with lipidema are obese, but I have to say that lately, especially I saw women who are not really obese, so borderline obese, and they have lipidema. So it's not always together, but look at this woman. Obviously, she's really obese. Look at these huge legs. Uh, 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 look at these upper arms. Um, and look at the, when you listen, lateral position, uh, lateral uh, 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 view, this huge belly pulls down. It's you. It's very heavy, and it pulls down the the whole posture down here, and the large buttocks pulls it up. So you see the curves of the lumbar circle spine. This is much more curved than normal, and that can cause a lot of pain in this area. A lot of hair fat, by the way, is a visceral fat, fat inside the belly, which is. Uh, primarily uh, white fat, which is very bad, uh, uh, has very bad prognostic uh, significance. This is stage four when the patients develop lipolymphedema. Now you see this swelling in the feet. And if you try to pinch normal person, if you pinch the skin at the dorsum of the foot, you can easily pinch and lift it. In pa patients with lipolymphedema, you cannot do that. That's called the steamer sign. Um, here's another dead patient of mine that she had some liposuction before in the upper part of the body, and but she developed very bad lymphedema of the lower legs, of the lower legs. Um, this is another patient that I'll show you. She's 33 pounds. She has huge fat pockets, and uh, look how separated the feet are. Uh, there's a, a genu valgum or valgus deformity at the knees. And look how the angle, uh, the angle in the lumbar circle spine, and she had a lot of pain uh, in there. And look, when she walks, yeah. I try to make them walk all in my office. 
look how she tilting from one side to the other and look how the belly pulls it down and look how much rubbing she has between the the, the, the thighs. Um, very miserable. That's another patient. Actually, she's going to be operated next month. Um, she has very minimal lymphedema in the feet. Look at the feet. They really have minimal lymphedema, but she has this huge fat pocket at the lower thigh between between the knees. In I show you it here and show it here. That's really heavy. I, I can tell you that's heavy. And that's a real problem with this patient. She has also very large uh, uh, saddlebags, very heavy. So she has to deal with many issues with the heavy body weight, with abnormal posture, knee problems, a lot. And I can tell you, she's very compliant. She's very energetic. She travels, she does everything she can, but she reached a point she cannot do any better. How we treat lipidema? Well, the most basic thing are uh, compression garments. These are elastic garments that you see they're swelling, but providing some resistance to the fluid accumulation. And by decreasing the, uh, the fluid accumulation, it decreases the pain. But these are elastic garments. There's another category of garment, which is non-elastic or short stretch. And they're not stretched, the, you, the, the, the fixed length. And you can see on the, this one with Velcro attachment, this one with, the, like, uh, with hooks. And, uh, and what it does is basically uh, provide resistance to the calf muscles. So when the calf muscle contract, when you walk, it meets the resistance of the short stretch. And the pressure applies to the veins and to the lymphatics and force movement of the lymphatic and the venous blood. Very important part of the treatment. Um, other aspect of the treatment, food is huge. Uh, it's much more than if men made it, don't eat it. It's much more than that. You really have to adapt anti-inflammatory, low-inflammatory diets, um, keep moving. Uh, whole body vibration is very helpful. Exercise, Pilates, pull exercise, very helpful, but whole body vibration, very helpful. Wrapping, I mentioned before, the short stretch. Um, when uh, the disease really, uh, when the short stretch does not help, then we have to move to the pump, to the external pump. We cannot rely only on our calf muscle pump. So we have to need the external pump. So there's the flexita, the, the lympha press and all those. And there's all kind of supplement, anti-inflammatory and those that help to move the lymphatics. But diet, losing weight, not always help. You see, this is a patient of Dr. Stutz in Germany. She's 34. You can see she's exercise, she's dieting. She, look how slim she is at the upper body and look at the lower body. That's all lipidema fat. Um, many people ask a bariatric surgery. Well, this elderly lady shared bariatric surgery. It does not affect the lipidema fat, it affects the obesity fat or the white fat, but not lipidema fat. And this is another patient of mine that she had bariatric surgery. You can see the scar all along the belly. She had a, a gastric bypass. She lost a lot of weight. You see how slim the upper arms, but look at the lower legs. This is primarily lipidema fat. So, Let's go to the title of our talk. I have lipidema. What should I do now? Um, conservative treatment may temper and slow the progression of lipidema, but many times it's not enough. And there is no definitive medical treatment for lipidema at this point. That's, I mean, and that's the key sentence really. When despite non interventional conservative treatment, you cannot perform your normal activities of daily living that are still compromised. Then you have to th start to think about liposuction. And liposuction has been effective in reducing pain and improving the mobility. Let's take a hypothetical patient. Let's call her Cleopatra, for example, okay? So here, here you see the symptoms, here you see the age. Um, 
So Cleopatra found out at puberty when she was about 14 that she has lipidema. She recalls that she had large leg, lower leg. So maybe she had a little bit symptoms, very little symptom. And uh, at the age of 18, she went to college. Um, symptoms continue to get worse. Um, some at the end of college, she got married. And at the age of 28, she got pregnant. What happened she got pregnant? Symptoms got worse. But still plateaued after that, I done not, not so bad. Uh, not so bad, but she's happily married at age of 32. She got pregnant again. Again, symptom got worse, but then plateaued, not too bad. She could leave, so she had another baby. She got pregnant again and symptom color, and then really got worse. Very common issue. So she went to consultation. So at the age of 42, we have consultation. So I assess and I evaluate her. One of the most important things that I, we are trying to assess and we do it together with the patient. How has symptoms at this point, the symptoms at that level relate to the ability to perform her daily activity, the ADL. <clears throat> Obviously here it's quite significant. Obviously she came to see me. She cannot live normal life. So obviously she needs some to be done. Are we rushing to surgery? As Stephanie told you before, hold on, not yet. Let's apply and optimize conservative measures. And I think it's very important to apply all of them that are available and optimize them. In other words, do more and more until it doesn't help more. So poor Cleopatra, she improved a little bit, but then the symptoms plateaued and are still well above the ADA line, that's a time to have to think about surgery. If she was lucky, the improvement will be significantly more and it plateau here, very close to the ADA line, and maybe we can wait with surgery. Unfortunately, many patients come with that, but I see a good number of patients that can improve and we can hold off. So why it is important to optimize and apply conservative measures, Although it sounds like a stupid question, but actually it's very important because, as I said, maybe surgery for now will not be necessary. Maybe. Maybe in five years from now we can offer something better. Now, other issues, we have to convince your insurance company that you tried everything possible short of surgery with that defines medical necessity. Because if you cannot perform your ADL and you tried everything, this is medically necessary. It's not cosmetic, it's reconstructive surgery. And three, as Stephanie also mentioned, we really want to see change in lifestyle. You really need to change your lifestyle if you want to have long-term successful surgery. If after surgery you feel great, you feel you can move better, blah, blah, all that, and you start to go back to your old bad habits, I guarantee you, you'll get worse again. Two parts to the optimizing conservative treatment. One is diet, uh, anti-inflammatory, low-inflammatory diet. Uh, I'm not a specialist in this area, but I know from my own experience, personal and for my patients that keto diet or Mediterranean diet or RAD or paleo, you name it, they're very helpful. They feel better. The skin is less sensitive. They're more alert. They feel better. Intermittent fasting, it's very important to add combined with the anti-inflammatory diet. Intermittent fasting, you eat for 18 hours, you eat, I'm sorry, you eat for six hours in the day, like from 12 to six, and you don't eat between six and 12. That will help a lot to lose weight because anti-inflammatory diet, it can, you cannot lose a lot of weight many times. And supplements, again, that's not my field, but. All my patients, I prescribe diosmin, which helps them uh, uh, minimal the leakage from the lymphatic vessel, the mucinex that you give to your kids, they make the, 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 the edema less viscous and others. Um, decongestion, very important to optimize it. Manual lymphatic drainage and bandaging, usually at very temporary, then don't help for a long time, and they really cannot provide and you cannot go all day, I mean, in manual uh, lymphatic drainage, you just cannot do it. Garment, very important, very important garment. Whole body vibration, 
like trampoline or, 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 or vibration play, helpful. Short stretch straps, uh, wraps, I'm sorry, is the next step because if you still accumulate edema while you're on compression, then you, have, you, have, you should try to make your calf muscles more uh, effective. And that's by uh, uh, wrap the leg with short stretch, uh, 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 with short stretch, so that the, the calf muscles meet the resistance of the short stretch and compression pump, which is the last uh, available uh, uh, method. So let's go back to Cleopatra. Here she came to consultation. We applied three to six months of, uh, of, uh, uh, of conservative treatment. So what we are doing, so if she, gone, if she improves so much and she plateaus around the ADA line, I think we don't have to rush with surgery. But if she's here, obviously we have to move on uh, to the next step. So what's lymph sparing liposuction? The all time, uh, until the 1990s or so, people looked at lipidemamosi as a cosmetic, aesthetic dysfunction. So they used the technique they usually applied in the, uh, for liposuction, all the techniques to lipidema like dry technique, large cannula, they go criss and cross over the area. And what it resulted with destruction of many lymphatic channels and many patients ended up with a, a, a lymphedema or lipolymphedema. So then uh, there uh, came uh, the concept of lymph sparing liposuction, a technique, techniques that will preserve the lymphatics. And there are two basic techniques. One is the tumescin and one is the water jet. And the tumescin, basically we infuse the fat layer with a lot. I mean, a lot, can you like six, eight, or maybe more uh, liters of a uh, normal saline or regular lactate of solution mixed with, uh, with the local anesthetic. The, per the purpose is to swell, to, to, to mess is to swell, to, to mess the fatty layer. And you let it sit there for about an hour, hour and a half, the fluid penetrate, penetrate the fat, and then you apply vacuum and you suck it out. The water jet, or we call it wall, is you infiltrate with much smaller uh, volume, maybe, uh, two liters, maybe two and a half, you use small cannula, and then you use the same shape cannula in, uh, to eject a fan-shaped uh, water jet that basically break the fat and at the same time aspirate or suction the, um, the, the, the fat and the water that you use to break it. Um, you put the infiltration in the beginning, you put just to get local anesthesia. You don't need to swell the tissue just to provide enough for local anesthesia. And if I show you here, if you look here, that's kind of try to show the, the, the two medicine. So you see you add fluid, it swells, everything kind of breaks the fat, and then you can come in and suction it in the in the uh, wall uh, technique, I have to find my, uh, in the wall technique, oh here, in the wall technique, you just infuse enough to, uh, to, to numb the area. You don't have to swell it. And then you apply the suction and all this fat comes out. Oh, why cannot change slide? Okay, so that's basically the principle of the wall technique. The same cannula you can eject the the the, the fan, uh, the fan of water, the water jet, and these holes you can aspirate it out and in, but goes in with all the fat. Um, I personally like the water jet, the wall te uh, the wall technique, although the result with the two messing uh, technique. 
are very good, are very comparable. But I personally came to like the 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 wall technique. Uh, the reason I like it because I use much less for local anesthesia uh, to numb the area, to infiltrate there. As a result, I need to use a smaller amount of local anesthetic, and I can do maybe more in one procedure. But I can tell you that the uh, to messing technique is very, very good. good. So here we start with this situation. We try to take this out, how we do it. Okay, first of all, the patients come, we mark here, we, we mark what area we're aiming to do. Then she lies and she's fully awake, by the way, we'll talk about it in a minute. Uh, we clean her. We give local anesthetic, like you go to the dentist, like lidocaine, different local places. Then you make small cuts and you put the cannula and you infiltrate it with the local anesthetics. Just enough to make it numb. Then you swear, you go with the cannula and you use it to irrigate the fat out. So you use the water jet with the suction and you can see the yellow fat comes up the tube. And here we are done basically. This is Dr. Stutz pictures, by the way, not mine. We are done. You see how much fat was removed. And then you put dressing, you stand the patient, you try to squeeze whatever left inside, all this fluid out, a lot come out, I can guarantee you, much more than what you see here. And you put a garment on, a, on her, then you put something to protect, so if you not mess around, and you uh, ambulate the patient, she goes home. You provide some uh, lymphatic drainage for, uh, for a while, you keep the garment for two weeks, 24 seven, you take shower with that, you keep it on, and then 12 hours on, 12 hours uh, off. And basically, that's something that many people ask me. So here's the, the machine, doesn't matter. But here, we infiltrated this patient that take in my office with two liter of a, a numbing solution. We used 12 liters to irrigate it. Then we collected six canisters. Each of them is three liters. So you see, we collect a total of 18 liters. The lower part, the infernatant, which is mostly the fluid that we use to irrigate out and that doesn't have much fat. It's, it's a, a 2.4 liter times six, it's 14.4 liter. And the upper part, which you see from 24 to 3,000, 600 is about 3.6 liters in this patient. So that's about what we take in usual procedure. I would say between 2.5 and 3.5. Rarely we go about 3.5. People ask me, why not? How much is too much? How much should it take? So a few considerations. First, we cannot use too much fluid because you can get fluid overload. It absorbs by the body and we have to be careful. Also, we are using local anesthetics, which can, uh, uh, we have to be consider a, a, a reaction to local anesthetics. And a very important factor is how long the patient can remain comfortable while lying in bed, because the procedure takes a few hours. We can take a break sometime, she can eat, she can drink, but it's still not comfortable. So, some we, uh, so that's something we should take under consideration. Big question, does it hurt? Well, let's, let's look at it. What is pain? Many definitions to pain, but basically it is a subjective experience. The two parts to it, the physiological, like uh, we move or our heart rate goes uh, up and psychological uh, response, like we get upset, uh, angry, and all that in response to some nauseous stimulation. So um, two parts to the experience. One is what we feel, like this lady, poor lady, the, the nurse trying to get blood out of her, and that triggers certain behavior, like she's doing her face, making face, maybe she's jerking the arm, moving away. So these are the two, these are the two components of the, of, the, of the pain. Now, not all pains, not all nauseous stimulation are the same. Uh, and 
we can modify them. Um, we can modify, I give you some analgetics, like a pain pill or local anesthesia or general anesthesia. General anesthesia, you don't feel anything. We can help you to control the anxiety. And it depends how you come to the procedure. It depends, are you fatigued? Are you stressed? Are you excited? I mean, if this lady will have the blood drawn in the morning after she had good night rest, and, or maybe she did some yoga in the morning, she will not make this face. But if she comes at the end of the day, tired, upset, she was fighting with her husband, whatever, then she'll get upset. So all these factors should be taken under consideration. That's why surgery was done before. Uh, that's 1700, I believe. I mean, there was no anesthesia. So you see this guy, this surgeon, um, I hope I look a little bit different than him, but he's cutting <laughs> the, the arm uh, of the patient. This guy is digging into the sc uh, scalp. I don't know what the hell he's doing there. And I don't understand what this guy is doing. Well, we are better today. We have general anesthesia. When you put totally asleep and you're totally dependent on the anesthesiologist on the machine. You can do regional anesthesia like epidural that totally uh, put totally asleep uh, uh, the part of the body. Then the conscious sedation is very commonly used today, like Merkel's anesthesia, uh, sedation, not anesthesia. I'm sorry, so anesthesia when you put patient to sleep, that's sedation. You can give twilight anesthesia, some people call it. Um, it's very commonly used, like in, uh, undergo gastroscopy or colonoscopy or shorter procedure. Uh, but patient, the key is the patient breathe by herself. There's no airway. And there is the local anesthesia, um, which that's what we are using. And the question is, if you do well, the water jet assisted liposuction while the patient's awake, comfortable, and relaxed, is it possible? Is it oxymoron? Or is it possible to be awake and comfortable and relaxed at the same time? Well, first of all, why I prefer local anesthesia? First of all, general anesthesia uh, or any other more invasive method, it's not necessary for this procedure. It's an overkill. We can do all that with local anesthesia. And another reason, I like the patient to be fully awake. Maybe one of the people who listen to me say, wow, I don't want to be awake. But I tell you, it's very important that you're awake because you can move. You can uh, move your feet. You can breathe. You can cough. You prevent many, many uh, post-operative complications. And you can do it in the office. It makes it much faster recovery, less costly. So, uh, so the kids, you don't need more invasive uh, anesthesia. Here, for example, that's in my small operating room. I do the liposuction. The patient's looking. We talk, and she can move. I tell her after the move from the right, move to the left. Uh, remind to move her feet, uh, her arms. It's so helpful. Take a deep breath. It's so much better. And I want the patient, that's what I'm trying to say, I want the patient not to be passive, but to be active participant in the surgery. Because if you're not anxious, I like you to be participant, because then you can give me, you can tell me if you feel pain, what's happening to you. It's so much better. And I tell you that all patients like it. Before surgery, just to make everybody happy, I do a skin test in the arms and I inject different kind of local anesthetics or combination of that. And after one hour, I can pinch the skin at the area. You see this lipedema patient, the one she's so bruising, by the way. You pinch it and you see which one gives you the best pain control. And so the patient goes, uh, comes to surgery uh, knowing that we are going to use effective local anesthesia. Uh, adding the nitrous oxide was a big thing for us because that really helps to control anxiety and pain. And that really uh, make a big addition to, to surgery. And since 2018, I believe, uh, uh, almost two years, we are using that. And I'll tell you what, it, uh, what 
it could be resolved. Why we like it? Because we could cut back on our local anesthetic by 50%, 50% less local, while the patients were not more painful. That's the key, we're not painful because we could control the anxiety and the pain with the nitrous oxide. So that it's much safer. So much less complications, you see less nausea, uh, blood pressure changes after surgery, lightheadedness, no, uh, all this, uh, all this uh, uh, change, uh, much more improved. And the faster recovery, after two hours, they usually they walk out of the office with the spouse or with a friend to the car and go back to the hotel or to home. And, and if you see here, heart rate, 65, blood pressure, all the vital signs kept very normal. So that's important statement. We all hate pain, but it, pain is essential and important protector from injury or damage, including surgeon's damage. So what happens if a, a Cleopatra is, under, is undergoing surgery and she still feels pain? So number one, I check if it's my fault. Maybe my cannula went a little bit deeper only bit not exactly the place, so I correct myself. If she still have pain and I feel she's a little bit tense, we give her some nitrous oxide. You can give her five, six inhalation of nitrous oxide and she immediately, she'll feel better. She'll tell me, I feel better. If still it's not enough, we can infiltrate it with one numbing solution. And finally, we can give her a little bit Percocet or Xanax and we can move on. So you feel what I'm doing, but it doesn't hurt you and it doesn't bother you. Okay, what else will make the patient feel comfortable? Okay, drinking. Since she's fully awake, so she can drink, she can snack, she can joke. These ladies love to gossip, they gossip a lot. I don't want to tell what I heard during the procedure, that's confidential. And at the same time, I'm removing fat. You see the fat comes up the tube. What else helps? A lot of TLC, she gets a little bit worried or something like that, a lot of tender loving hair. And you see, she gives a TLC and the fat is come out. Oh my God. That always makes the patient happy. If I show her that the right thigh after liposuction, look how thin it is. And the left one that I did not do yet, I show the difference, I say, oh, wow, that's great. Or when she see the fat, out in the canister, that makes her very happy. And of course, the laughing at the nitrous oxide, that's very helpful, as I said. Now we don't want the patient to jump out of bed and start to laugh and jump and all that, but we want to be comfortable, to go through the operation comfortable. Very important, liposuction, treatment of lipidema, the primary goal is to restore the ADL, to restore the ability to, to, to perform the activities of daily living, to be able to walk again, to improve your gait, to take away the pain, to improve the bruising, to be able to sit straight, to go back to work, to be, have conduct productive life, to take care of children, and all that, to try to restore the abnormality in the gait and to stop the, the attrition of the joint. And many times patients say that they've stopped, the, 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 the knee pain was resolved. And to try to prevent or minimal progression to, leave, uh, to leave, lie, lipolymphedema. And so important to control, to improve the depression, the anxiety. Uh, many patients, when they fill up the form, they say, oh, I'm depressed. And I talk to them, I don't think they're depressed. I think it's appropriate response, emotional response to a disease that the patient does not have control on. But once we, we solve the problem, the emotional status improves so much. And that's very, very important. Cosmetic improvement is not one of the goals. You may feel better, you may look better, but that's not one of the goals of the procedure. Um, and when you talk to insurance company, stay away from this uh, word cosmetic or aesthetic because that's the way that they always will try to, uh, to deny you. Still, it's nice when we have, it's, it's nice, uh, it's still, it's still nice 
to see some improvement. So this lady, um, that's when you mark it for the low leg, but look at the upper arms before surgery, and then when you mark it for the belly, look at upper arm will look much better. Um, restoring normal gait. You remember this lady from before? So that was before surgery. You remember how her body weight applied to abnormally to this area, the uh, first metatarsal. And that's Dr. Stutz, beautiful study he does. Look how nicely the weight after surgery uh, 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 stresses uh, the, the older area, but also this area and this area. So that obviously when the weight distribution after surgery it moved toward normal, I don't want to say normal, but moved toward normal, you may save your knee joints. That's a quick, I'm almost done. That's just a quick survey that we have done a few years ago. We're in the process of doing another survey now. Among 20 women, US women that underwent surgery, that's a mean age. Um, uh, most of them attempted weight loss, etc. All of them had pain almost. None came to say for cosmetic reason. And after 10 months, you can see how the score. Uh, of spontaneous pain went from 4.2 to 1.4, a uh, uh, tenderness from 4.5 to 1.7, etc. That you can go all along the list. And if you uh, combine all the scores, it went from 31.46 to 13.8. So that's nice improvement. Um, they're just plotting this uh, last data. Um, well, 